Okay, so uh, this is the story for the uh, ultra fast dissociation and for this uh, um, internal clock. But uh, this, if we uh, do this uh, exudation process in water, the ultra fast dissociation is not the only thing which can happen. And for it, so we, we start from the neutral water and ground state. We induce the score excitation. As I said, we can have earlier OJ decay and end up with H2O plus, or we can have pre OJ dissociation, which I have defined as ultra fast dissociation, and we arrive at the OH plus fragment. But for both H2O plus and OH plus uh, molecular ion, it is possible that the dissociation continues, that we have a post OJ dissociation. So uh, besides this uh, uh, ultra fast process, we can have some other processes which take place later on. If they take place later on, we don't see them in the um, resonant OJ spectrum. So we need some, let's say, uh, complementary technique to uh, get the uh, overall picture for this uh, dynamics in the core excited water. So I'm, I'm going to uh, present some data which are out of a PhD thesis of one of our students, which is going to be discussed soon. So the measurements in this case are performed at Soleil, the French synchrotron near Paris. They're performed on Pleiad. Pleiad is a, a soft X-ray beamline, which is dedicated to atomic and molecular and cluster physics. And on Pleiad, so this is an ondulator beamline, the energy range is from uh, 10 to uh, uh, 1,000 1, EV. And then there is a, uh, a series of end stations insta installed on Pleiad. And we work on the uh, end station, which is called EPCA. EPCA is an electro-ion coincidence instrument. So uh, there is a ion time of flight and uh, an electron, a toroidal electron spectrometer, and we can detect uh, ions and electrons in coincidence with um, a resolution for the um, electron kinetic energy, which is not comparable for what I shown before. The, the spectra I have shown at the beginning are taken with what's called um, hemispherical electron analyzer, which has a good resolution. But the toroid analyzer has enough resolution to um, obtain information by this uh, uh, electro-ion coincident process. So uh, just to give you a first example of which kind of information we can deduce from uh, uh, electro-ion coincident measurements, those are ion time of flight spectra. And you see, uh, three peaks, OH+, plus, H2O+, plus, and O+. Plus. And those spectra are collected in uh, two different conditions, uh, which means uh, with uh, um, two different windows in coincidence with electrons, a wider window and a uh, narrower window. And in both cases, the window is uh, for the uh, kinetic energy of the electrons, which are measured in coincidence with the ion, is chosen in a way to include this, uh, um, the um, kinetic energy of the electrons related to the uh, fragment peaks. But you see, uh, if th the main uh, peak is the OH fragment, so it is consistent with this idea of ultra-fast dissociation. But you can immediately see that we can get some extra information. For instance, we see also O+, plus. O+, plus, which means, which is a, a step um, further after the formation of OH+. Plus. And also, depending on the uh, width of the window, so this window is larger, you see, we see a, a bit of H2O+, plus if the window is larger, and this H2O+, plus disappears if the window is narrower, which means that in this case, we can catch in the window also the tail of some molecular peaks. So this is uh, to give you um, some sort of general idea of the kind of information that we were looking for. So, as I said, 
we we are looking for uh, extra information. For example, these are calculated potential energy curves for the final state, which are reached after uh, molecular decay. And you can see that at least one of them is quite dissociative. And this is a uh, dissociation, which, uh, as I said, which uh, uh, takes place after the resonant Auger decay. So to uh, identify it, we really have, we really need to, to go th this kind of uh, complementary measurements. And so in this case, we have chosen electron ion coincidences. Okay, this is uh, the uh, overall uh, result of this kind of experiment. This is the electron kinetic energy, which includes uh, the fragment line that I've shown before. The resolution here for this uh, uh, spectrometer APCI is not very good, but uh, the advantage here is that we can take, okay, okay. This spectra are taking a two value of uh, uh, photon energy on top and uh, with some detuning. This uh, uh, black curve here uh, includes uh, the uh, all ions in coincidence with electron kinetic energy in this region. This green curve is the coincidence with only OH fragments, OH plus ions, and this bl blue curve it's in coincidence with O plus ions. So uh, this is a first way in which we can use this uh, electro ion coincidence measurements to uh, sort of filter the general information that we can deduce from the resonant OJ spectra. And then we can look in these different regions and uh, here uh, I'm plotting the uh, time of flight, the ion spectra for these different regions. So for instance, if we go to this region, oh, okay, marked here are the uh, final state for the uh, OH plus. So if you go to this region, you see that basically we detect only the uh, OH plus fragment. And this is the, uh, the region where the, there are the most of these resonant Auger peaks that I have shown before. If we move uh, a little further up, you see that we also start to see the O plus fragment, and we see also more of it in this A region here, because here we have uh, another um, state of the OH plus, which is dissociative. This first state uh, that I have shown before, uh, I've shown you that they have a vibrational structure, which means they are bound state, but it's also a dissociative state which is difficult to identify in the resonant OJ spectrum because over, it overlaps with the um, spectator state. But in this way, we can uh, clearly extract it because we can see this um, contribution for the O plus fragment which comes from this state. And if we go in the other direction, here we are in, in the region where there are no fragment lines, but there is the tail of the uh, molecular peaks. And you can see that also here we see some OH plus fragment, which means that also for the molecular states, we, we, we have uh, this uh, dissociation after OJ decay, and we can catch it in the uh, ion spectra. Okay, so this, those are the potential curves for um, all these states, which are the OH plus states. You see this one, which is dissociative. But uh, so this is what I've shown before, this uh, um, electron can, uh, electrons in coincident OH plus and O plus. And another way in which uh, we can use this uh, electro ion coincidence measurement is the following. Okay, those are um, maps of the kinetic energy release versus the electron kinetic energy for the OH plus fragment and O plus fragment. I, I just want to um, draw your attention to this region of the kinetic, the kinetic energy release is the energy which is uh, um, carried out by the, by the living fragment. And this kinetic energy release is smaller for the ultrafast dissociation because the ultrafast dissociation takes place in a potential energy region where the uh, kinetic energy release is small because 
it starts from the uh, correct side of state. So if we filter the data that I've shown before by uh, this small uh, kinetic energy region, okay, this is the spectrum I've shown before with the um, electrons in cointer OH plus or O plus, if we filter in, you know, as a function of kinetic energy, uh, kinetic energy release, we can uh, more clearly extract the behavior of this uh, uh, four states, which are the final states for the OH uh, plus uh, fragment. And so you can see in this way, we can sort of subtract the contribution of the spectator states and uh, get a good picture of the behavior of this uh, OH plus uh, states. Okay, so uh, this ends the first part of my talk on the uh, Corho clock method and on the uh, way that one can use this uh, internal clock at synchrotron sources, which means uh, non time resolved source, but still to get information on uh, uh, the femtosecond scale. Okay, in the second part of my talk, I will move to a time resolved facility which in this case is the European XFEL. So probably some of you are familiar with it. Here we have DAISY, the storage ring in Hamburg. And this is the uh, electron accelerator, the three kilometers tunnel for the free electron laser. And at the end of this three kilometers, just outside Hamburg in Schoenfeld, we have the experimental hall for the free electron laser. So uh, this is a scheme of the beam lights which are available there. It's a SASE machine. And we are on, uh, we, the experimental facility I use is on SASE 3 and it's called SQS, Small Quantum Systems. And it's a facility which is dedicated to atomic, molecular and classic physics. So general scheme of SQS some important parameters. The uh, photon energy is for, from 0.5 to 3 kilo electron volts and it's fully tunable. The polarization is linear horizontal. The pulse energy could be really high, can go up to 10 millijoule, which is a pretty high number. The pulse duration, the pulse duration is uh, not exactly known, but uh, it's in the range 10 to 25 femtoseconds. And for the bandwidth in SASE mode is uh, about 1%, but now there is also a monochromator which is available and we can go up to resolutions of resolving power of 5,000. The um, number of pulses per train, this is an important parameter if you uh, want to do coincident measurement because you need high repetition rate and that's what they, you, you can choose a different timing, but uh, we were running at about um, kilohertz uh, repetition rate, which was more than enough. And the end station we use, it's the REMI. REMI means reactor microscope. This is a cold trims. And it's a cold trims which was built and installed by the cold trims specialist, the Frankfurt group. So uh, for samples, we can use gas or liquids and it's uh, electron ion coincidence with position sensitive detectors and very good momentum resolution on both ions and electrons and mass resolution 1% and uh, some 100% uh, of four pi collection for ions and electrons. So uh, we uh, was, it's a recent advances in technology that you can use cold trims to um, X-ray free electron laser because finally um, the European XFL has the uh, optimum uh, conditions to allow that. Okay, so uh, we measure water. So this is the title of the first paper that we are publishing now out of this experiment in a shared ionization induced femtosecond structural dynamics. In this case, is uh, core ionized, not core excited. And you, you, you can notice that that's, it's a large number of authors for this paper. In fact, 
this project, this uh, proposal was one of the so-called uh, community proposals. Community proposals, the, it means that there was the early stage of operation for the European XFR. Community proposal were proposal with one principal investigator, which was me in this case. And then we had the uh, SQS team, the Frankfurt team for the REMI, um, the theoretical team from CFL in Hamburg for the theoretical support. And then basically anybody from the community who wanted to join the proposal could. That's why we end up with about 60 uh, others. Okay, so what was the idea? The main feature of the uh, European XFL that we wanted to exploit is the possibility of doing a multiphoton ionization. And we had some calculation from the Robin Santras group, which showed that for um, if we use a photon energy of one kilo electron volt, we can basically strip the uh, water molecule of all its electrons. So it's a, a subsequent absorption of photons. So we have a series of photoelectron OJ, photoelectron OJ, even photoelectron, photoelectron processes. And at the end, we can strip the water molecule of all its electrons. We can really beat this four molecule to a pulp. So uh, this was the, um, the basis of the proposal. And then uh, the experimental technique that we used was triple ion ion coincidence. So a coincidence H plus, H plus, O, N plus. If we could actually measure N plus from O plus to O8 plus, which means we were really able to strip the molecule of all its electrons with subsequent photon absorption uh, steps. But uh, for this uh, first paper, we concentrated on one specific aspect. So this is this um, uh, artistic plot is the essence of the experiment. So we started with a isolated water molecule in gas phase. We have a photon arriving, core excitation, core ionization and OJ decay. So there are two electrons ejected and we are the formation, we have the formation of H2O double plus at time equal one, which is the arrival time of the first photon. And then at time equal two, there is the arrival of the second photon. But between time one and time two, the system, the H2O double plus has time to evolve. And the evolution depends on the distance in, in, within this interval. And then uh, measuring this, uh, so we, we arrive at this state, where we have the second coionization, the second OJ decay, uh, we end up with a quadruply charged species. And then we measure the H plus, H plus, O, two plus coincidences. And to do that, it, it's equivalent to uh, perform a series of snapshots in this time interval. And we, uh, we could identify uh, the um, fragmentation dynamics and the uh, uh, ex the evolution of this system um, by, uh, let's say, by uh, choosing some kind of experimental parameter and having a very good theoretical support. So let's start with the uh, results of the experiment. So this is a Newton diagram for the triple coincidence H plus, H plus, O2 plus. So the Newton diagram is constructed in this way. This is the direction of the O2 plus, and these are the momenta of the two hydrogens. This is experiment and this is theory. So if uh, uh, you're familiar, or even if you're not familiar with noodle plots, what one expect to see if the process is very simple. So we have a quadruply charged species which explodes for a Coulomb explosion. We will uh, act, expect to see just two spots here with the uh, two uh, protons in the symmetrical position and high momentum. But you see that it's not, uh, we have plenty of this in this Newton diagram, but there are also a lot of other structure, a lot of other protons which have, uh, do, do not have the maximum possible momentum, but they have some kind of distribution. So uh, the, the first idea was to uh, 
try to get more information from the noodle plots just using some other experimental parameter. And the experimental parameter we will use is the kinetic energy release. So here we have experiment and theory for the same, uh, the, uh, same uh, quadruple charged species, so H plus, H plus, or uh, two plus, but sliced in a function of kinetic energy release. So you can see that here for high kinetic energy release, the situation is uh, more um, is more in the direction of what uh, of the pure Coulomb explosion, but for um, lower and lower kinetic energy release, the situation is much more, much more complicated. So, uh, well, it's intuitively to um, deduce that if uh, uh, this uh, quadruple charged species is formed very fast. So this, the second photon is absorbed very fast after the first, then the system will have Coulomb explosion immediately and the kinetic energy release will be high. If the system has time to evolve, uh, because the interval between these two photons becomes longer and longer, then there will be some bond length stretching, some bond stretching, some bond angle opening, and the kinetic energy release will be lower. And this is uh, a first, um, information that we, we would get. But from the noodle plots, one can have this general picture, but one cannot have the correlation between the protons. So to obtain this correlation, we plotted this uh, coincident data in a different way. So this is position space, this is momentum space. So these plots, we, we call this plot scatter plots. Here, we plot the, these angles, the angle between the, uh, in momentum space, between the direction of the oxygen and of the two protons. And here we plot the moment of the two protons, one versus the other. So what we see here, we see that most of the events are in this region where both angles are around 115 degrees, which means in uh, position space, they are close to the ground state. But there are lots of events where the sum of these two angles, it's about 180 degrees. And so this is theory. And here in green, in the theoretical plot, we, uh, we stress all the points where this uh, bond angle is not uh, close to the uh, ground state, but is very much larger, which means there is some uh, bond angle opening or some unbending in, in this, uh, for, for this point. Also here, if we plot the moment of the two products, one versus the other, most of them are correlated. They have the same momentum, but uh, quite some of them. So this is experiment theory. And here in the theoretical plot, we uh, stress the points where this uh, moment are different, which means that one of the bond length is more stretched than the other one. So from this kind of scatter plot, we can deduce that um, there are two, uh, dynamical events. One is unbending and one is uh, um, asymmetry in the bond, in the stretching. And here there are some uh, theoretical modeling. Here we have kinetic energy release as a function of T2 minus T1. So you can see that kinetic energy release, it's uh, higher for very short times and then decreases. And here, uh, if you are familiar with this nomenclature, to reach this uh, quadruple charged species, you can have a photoelectron OJ, photoelectron OJ sequence, or a photoelectron, photoelectron OJ, OJ sequence. So creating a double cohort before the OJ decay. And the red points correspond to this PPAA because this can happen only for very short interval because we have to beat the OJ decay to create the double cohort. And here again, here we have this time interval the kinetic energy release, and you can see that here there are the um, events where the um, bond angle is open. So here we had the maximum for long times and short kinetic energy release. And here the, AC, the bond asymmetry. And here we have again theoretical plots. Here is the time interval. Here there is the angle. So you can see that the angle is close to the ground state a very short times and then it opens up. So here there are some sketches for two points here. Same for the uh, asymmetry in bond distance. 
is zero at zero times. And then uh, as the system evolves, it can be uh, more pronounced. So if you want to uh, plot movies of that, we, we, you can have, okay, red means one photon absorption. And then when it changes color, it's the, the second photon which arise. So if the second photon arise can catch the molecule in or the geometry, almost uh, the geometry of the ground state. And this can happen when this, the absorption of the second photon is very fast, or we can have, again, uh, we, we can, if the system has time to, to evolve, the second photon can arrive, uh, okay, in a situation where this bond structure is not the same for both. So you have two body fragmentation or uh, uh, you can have that the other possible evolution of the system is uh, this uh, unbending so you can have that the second photon can uh, catch this molecular ion in a situation where uh, the explosion takes place in a way uh, where these uh, two uh, protons leave almost at 180 degrees. Okay, so the basic message is that uh, we, we don't do uh, pump probe experiments because all these events are uh, within a, a single pulse. But if we can use uh, uh, experimental parameters like the kinetic energy release, and we have a good theoretical modeling, we can still uh, decode the behavior in this time interval in, the, in a sense that we uh, basically can take snapshots of what happens within this time interval. And of course, this time interval between the two photons goes from the absorption of the first photon to the maximum time, which is uh, uh, the length of the um, XFEL pulse, which is about 25 seconds, uh, femtosecond. Okay, to confirm that, I can show the data for higher charges. So here it's experimental theory, the uh, nuclear plots for O4 plus and O6 plus. And you can see the evolution when one goes further and further towards a pure Coulomb explosion. Same for this uh, plot, the scatter plots of the angle. You, you go uh, further and further towards this situation where this uh, um, bond angle is similar to the ground state. And same for the uh, asymmetry in the uh, proton momenta, which is reduced as a function of charge. Okay, so uh, basically the message that we, we can take home is that both unbending and two-body fragmentation are significant dynamic features occurring in the fragmentation of H2O after core ionization. And the importance of this dynamical pattern is that uh, basically it's for radiation damage and radiation chemistry. In liquid water, there are uh, many cases in which we, water is, uh, um, uh, is exposed to um, high intensity X-rays like medical applications and stuff like that. So for instance, if we think of this unbending motion, the momentum of the neutral oxygen is very reduced. And this can have uh, really consequences in the liquid environment. Okay, and so we hope that our insights are relevant in uh, high energy radiation damage. This is typical message because in the AMO community, we all have this uh, guilt complex that maybe what we do is not important in practice, but this is, I think it's very important for radiation damage in aqueous environment. Okay, my, my time is over. I just have time to um, thank all the uh, people who have made this uh, uh, results obtainable. So my main collaboration is with Marc Simon's group at LCPMR in, in Paris at Sorbonne. And so this is Marc Simon, a collaborator. The, um, the data from Pleiade has shown are the thesis of Farzad Hosseini. Then I had to thank for the measurement at Soleil, John Bosek, who's the responsible Pleiad and the Pleiad team for the measurement of the XFL, Michael Meyer and the SQS team, 
for the Remy and Session, the group at Frankfurt at the Goethe University, Till Janke, Marcus Schoeffler, Reinhard Dörner, and very important theoretical support from the Robin Santras group at CIFEL, especially Ludger in Hester. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Novella, for this very beautiful talk. Um, I have to, uh, to tell to the audience that you can ask questions through the live question and answer panel. So I'll check whether there is any, any question. Don't see any. No? Okay, then I'll... I'll take the opportunity and ask the first question. So the theory support was essential for uh, for, uh, for understanding of your experiment. Yes. Could you please tell me more on how the uh, theory part has been done? It's a multidimensional, multi-layer, multidimensional system. So how the computation has been done? Okay. Uh, so the theory part, for, for you, you mean for the XFL experiment, it's yes. uh, Robin Santra's group and they use what is called the X molecule toolkit. So they, it's a combination of uh, Hartrifac and um, Monte Carlo molecular dynamics. I, I can give you, um, uh, of course, some more, more details from, from the paper that we have uh, just uh, submitted. But uh, I mean, they, they have done a very thorough theoretical analysis, which, which was very important to especially because um, we, we have this uh, um, experimental parameter which is kinetic energy release, but the connection between the kinetic energy release and the timing, that was very much relying on this uh, theoretical modeling, I must say. Okay, thank you. I still don't see any, uh, any question. Um, at the question and answer panel. So please, uh, if you can uh, ask the question from the from the panel um, on the panel. Let me see. No. Okay, then we, con then, then we continue the discussion uh, between the two of us. Uh, okay, so about the possibility to perform, to perform pump probe experiments uh, on the setup, on ICH, um, European XFEL uh, setup, is it possible to have one photo at a time and then a look at the time resolution? Yes, yes, this is coming. It was not available when we did this experiment. So we, we, we call it, what we did, we call it pump probe within a single pulse. And was just not, uh, uh, I mean, at this European experiment was our experiment. There was another experiment on simulated Raman scattering on the same idea to, to use this uh, single, uh, to do pump probe within a pulse. But it's also possible now to do pump probe real pump probe, XX pump probe. We, we have some preliminary data on water double cohort, where we, we use one photon to ionize and one photon to excite. But uh, let's see, it's, it's a situation in, in progress. It will, will be soon available to, to do total pump, really uh, what's called pump probe. But we are happy that we could do this uh, single pulse pump probe uh, if we, we have been able to really decode the experimental information with this theoretical modeling. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I still don't see any, okay, there is finally a question. So I'm asking the question on behalf of uh, Matteo Bonanomi. Uh, is it possible to perform this kind of experiment with ions um, covariance map imaging in a VMI? Yes, you can certainly do covariance mapping. Covariance mapping is something that uh, 
we have done extensively where it was not possible to do real coincidence measurements because of the high repetition or, or the not high enough repetition rate. So now in this case at the European XFL, we did real coincidence measurements, but uh, you can do a BMI, ion electron BMI co coherence mapping, certainly you can. And at, for instance, at Fermi, we've been using covariance mapping because the repetition rate is not high enough to do real coincidence. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. So uh, there are, um, I don't see other questions. Um, okay, there is a, a, there is a, a discussion forum there is something in the discussion forum um, uh, from Sandra Boverle. How it is easy to reconstruct a movie without the late time from any of the statistics? To reconstruct a movie without uh, reconstruct a movie without the late time from any uh, from only the statistics. Yes, this is the. The, the center of what we call pump probe within a single pulse. It, we cannot control the time delay. This, this is uh, definitely true. But we can decode the information uh, like what we did with the kinetic energy release and the theoretical modeling uh, as a function of time within the single pulse. Of course, uh, it, it's true. This is not, it's not controlling the delay time. It's uh, having a hint of what happens for uh, the different delay times and having a, like a complete picture of these steps. What we say, it's okay, it's not a really a molecular movie. It's a, what we call it, it's a series of snapshots that we can obtain at different timing within the uh, pulse length. Okay, yes. So there is a, uh, there is a second question uh, from, um, Sorry, Nigel, your, 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 your microphone is not... Do you Im Wait a minute. So my microphone... Is it better? Okay. Do you hear me better? Okay, there is a second question. Uh, do you imagine doing the same with the larger polyatomic molecules, with larger polyatomic molecules? The same, the XFL? Sure. I suppose, sure. yes, the second. We, we, we can apply it to any kind of system. For polyatomic molecules, we, we have to focus on one particular aspect, of course, but uh, yes, I mean. Well, the theoretical yeah. aspects, I suppose. Yeah, theoretical aspects, of course, is very important. For instance, we have in mind something about charge migration, something like that. So. We have to choose uh, polyatomic molecules in a proper way to, to, to be able to extract the information. But sure, I mean, you can do a lot of things on, on polyatomic molecules. We started from water because it's honestly, water is the default. <laughs> when you start, you want to start with something that is so universal. That, that was the, the starting point. Okay, th there is also the, the, um, another question, um, also from Sandra, but you need a reaction between the kinetic energy and the delay. Okay, uh, as I said, we cannot control the delay. We have derived this uh, relationship between the kinetic energy and, and the delay. The, the, the kind of plots, the theoretical plots I have shown before, yes. What you can directly derive from the experiment is the fact that uh, you see the evolution of the, uh, the evolution of the difference of the Newton diagrams as a function of kinetic energy release, and you can intuitively connect it to the delay because uh, it for uh, short times, you, when you have the, Coulomb, the immediate Coulomb explosion, it's intuitive to uh, deduce that, uh, that then the, um, the second photon has caught the molecule more or less uh, in uh, uh, geometry close to the ground state without a lot of time for evolution. So it's uh, the behavior of this uh, um, 
um, momentum distribution as a function of kinetic energy release is intuitive, but we really have needed this uh, strong theoretical modeling to, to get what we call the snapshots. So, okay, I think our, uh, we are running out of time. I would like to thank uh, you very much for your presentation, a very beautiful talk. All the participants, uh, we cannot uh, thank you in live. So thank you very much and I uh, hope to have um, you all attending the next uh, autochemistry webinar. So, okay, thank, thank you everybody for being there. Um, Really sorry, I could not see you. I will have much preferred to see you in person, but thank you anyway. Bye. Bye, Nadja. Bye bye. Bye bye.